upstairs at Freilix, shell 310, real one. No more of that talk or I'll put the fucking leeches on you, understand? <laughs> Get in. I'm gonna get my notes together. When here. one talks about in my favorite meme, it goes, when one talks about a Terry Gilliam film, one must be baked to talk about said Terry Gilliam film. Okay. <laughs> Not all of them though. I mean it's just uh I mean, okay, you've got a couple of straightforwards, okay, like Twelve Monkeys and fucking Fisher King. That's like as straightforward Gilliam as you can get. What about like say Brazil or Time Band? That's oh, the, neither one of those are straightforward. They're that's all Terry Gilliam. Or, it's all like his style, you know. What about let me see? Yeah, you can't say Munchausen. Munchausen. That no. movie is in a world all its fucking own. Uh, Doctor Parnassus is in an, and is in a world all its own. Uh, Brothers Grimm. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's an easily accessible film because that did have Miramax money behind it. My wife is upset. That she's not able to contribute this conversation because Terry Gilliam is one of her favorite directors. And she followed his work all the way back from, you know, Monty Python. There's also Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which he co-directed. And uh, also his first film was Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky. Which is another one of my favorites because it's just so ridiculous, the whole thing, the whole premise. And it's still in keeping with the idea that Gilliam always does. He loves, and these two movies that we're going to talk about definitely put the sp spotlight on characters that may be completely out of their minds but we follow them around everywhere from the beginning of their adventure to the end and it's the same people were involved too you got Nicola Pecorini shooting it shooting both movies and his co-writer on both movies was Tony Grassoni of course working from a screenplay that was written by Alex Cox and Todd Davies because Alex Cox was originally the guy who was going to direct this and this was his project until it was taken away from him by Universal because they didn't because like his Because Rhino, Rhino didn't have faith in him. And well, it's not actually, no, no, it wasn't even Rhino who had faith in him. It was Hunter Thompson himself who didn't have faith in him. Because like what was originally supposed to happen was Alex Cox was still going to direct, but they were going to bring on Terry Gilliam to produce. And then Hunter S. Thompson loved him so much. He said, look, you can bring Terry Gilliam on, but the only way you're going to bring him on is as a director. I want him to make this movie. It's such a strange kind of like left field choice to have Gilliam make this movie because I I, I didn't really and, think and, he would have it in him to. to oh, neither to make did the movie. I because like, dude, this is a movie where you know his visual style would be on fucking point. Yeah, but his storytelling that's hit or miss. Yeah, yeah, that's true, and that's that's maybe my only issue is that. You know, and, and this goes back even to, like, Time Bandits and things like that. It's crazy. I mean, it's just sort of like taking someone's mental illness and putting it on film. <laughs> That's how I've always thought of Terry Gilliam's work. Even The Fisher King. The Fisher King is a very, even though it's a studio project and he was brought to it and, he, and they asked him to direct it because he seemed like the right person for the job, it seems like such a, a thing that if I didn't know that he was a hired gun to work on Fisher King. I would have thought he had he had made the movie himself, you know? I mean, I agree with you. I mean, at the same time, though, it has a little bit of a studio feel to it. Like, okay, 12 Monkeys, that's another one. That movie has a real big studio feel to it. It does, you know, but there are these little... There are these little... The, but there's the touches. Gilliam there's bits. the touches where you know it's like, Terry Gilliam made this. They call I it... I know for a fact he fucking made it. Yeah, yeah. And my um, I have a sin signature edition uh, Universal Laserdisc of, as do I of 12 as monkeys and there's a documentary on it called the hamster factor and that's terry gilliam right there he creates this enormous kind of picturesque display and in the middle in the middle of this picture he's got a hamster on a wheel in the middle of the shot and that's terry gilliam right there <laughs> he he wants to be able to make move and he's always had a problem with this i don't know why maybe it's because he's kind of an asshole and, he is. He's a cock. Hollywood a cock. doesn't doesn't understand him, or they don't get him, or they don't like the fact that he just goes out and makes a movie. So, it, like, he was offered. Uh, actually, he wasn't offered per se, but J.K. Rowling wanted him to direct the Harry Potter movies, and so Warner Brothers went to him and they asked him, "What would you do if you were directing a Harry Potter movie?" So he gave him a bunch of ideas. I would do this, 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 and this, and they said, "Well, thank you for your time," and they told him to get the fuck out of there. They did not want him making the movie. Because they no, were because it would have been no, 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 no. They would have thought they would have. They were worried that he would make it too much of a Terry Gilliam movie, and not the kind of yeah. product that can be easily consumed. You know the way Chris exactly. Columbus I mean, the th if and no Terry Gilliam can film, dare I say that I think maybe Twelve Monkeys is probably his most straightforward film. Uh, you know, like like yeah. to the point. Well, I don't know. Fisher King, point. Fisher King also. Fisher King too, because he was a hired gun. I'm just saying, like. <laughs> 
out of legend, out of any movie that Terry Gilliam ever did on his own, no studio interference, whatever. Twelve Monkeys just feels like his most straightforward film. It feels like something that anybody can access. But the point is, every other movie he's made, it takes a special kind of group to access those movies. You don't yeah. want that guy making a Harry Potter film to where you need everybody to access it. <laughs> Granted, his visual style would have been great, but nobody would have been like, "What the fuck are we watching here, man?" Well, it's like why Ale- do we need Ale- Alex Cox is the same way yet? though. Hell, yeah, but Alex Cox hasn't had the kind of career that Terry he's a bit, you know, had. Alex Cox is a very he's a very talented filmmaker. You know, Repo Man was incredible. Yeah, uh, Sid and Nancy. Sid and Nancy. I even Sid enjoyed Nancy. Straight to Hell. I, I did. And Straight uh, to Hell was really good. I like Straight to Hell. There's another one he did, uh, something called Highway Patrolman or something like that. It was a movie that he made in Mexico, and he has a great he has a great eye. He's a great. I think he's a great filmmaker, but I think this would have been too big and too unwieldy gilliam is used to just throwing money down the toilet <laughs> he's like that plus he's commanded a great deal of respect you know johnny depp oh yeah was was hired for this movie uh you know all the people that worked on this movie wanted to work with terry gilliam that's why there's an incredible cast when you look at the cast you don't really see them you have to be I looking know. you have to watch this movie like 15 times to to see oh my god look at that that's that guy from that thing and there's another yeah. guy from that thing there's gary Busey. there's ellen barkin that's cameron diaz you know, in there for yeah. two seconds, there's there's Lyle Lovett, there's 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 fucking mini me is in this movie. And Pen- then Hunter S. Hunter S. Thompson himself. Oh my god, there I am. There I am. I'm right over there. <laughs> yeah, the Hunter S. Thompson, who's no longer with us, I should point out. He uh, I believe he uh, uh committed to his he committed to he blew his brains out or something, right? Mm-hmm. He wrote a, a, a very interesting He was in he was in bad movie. health though anyway. That's what I he hear. Just, That's what I he hear. He just wanted to end it. He was just like, but I this don't this suffer. this was a movie that they were trying to get made for years because it's unfilmable, really. When you think about it, I read Fear and Loathing. Uh, my wife has a copy of it. I've read it. It's just a journal. It's just basically a journal. Yeah. About two characters. I've never read the book, but that's all I know. I mean, I just know it's just a journal. It's basically, it's basically Tuesday, it Tuesday, January twentieth. 1969, 5 30 a.m. I wake up. Uh, I'm surrounded by 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 half eaten grapefruit. You know, it's like that. It's it's just all it's it's all just sort of like rambling stream of consciousness, weird drug induced stuff. It's very interesting too because in a way the movie glorifies drug usage, but it also does warns against it in a lot of ways. I, I mean, like if you're if you're flying and you're sailing like Johnny Depp, all you really need is Benicio del Toro. In a bathtub filled with grapefruit, and then throwing up. I mean, <laughs> that that some of the most grotesque stuff is in this movie. Seriously. Oh God, the the lizard scene is is yes, the lounge lizard. Right there, you'd figure that's where that's when you say that you know that movie movie's unfilmable. But then that's one of the scenes to where you know it's unfilmable but for some reason. And Terry th- Gilliam pulled it off. I think that's the reason Gilliam wanted to do the movie is because he wanted to do those visuals. That was really all it was about for him. And Depp was so committed, he actually shaved his head, messed up his hairline just to... He wasn't wearing a wig for any of that. He actually nope. did cut his hair. And he does a fine job. I mean, he really does a fine job. I've seen he, He's Hunter actually Thompson in wearing interviews. Hunter S. Thompson's clothes. He... Okay. He I, lived in his basement. I don't... Yeah, they hung out together. It was the same... The, uh, Bill Murray did a movie uh, a while where back. The Buffalo, where the Buffalo Realm. Where he did play Hunter Thompson. He wasn't playing Raul Duke. He was actually playing Hunter Thompson in Colorado, flashing back to memories of him and his lawyer, played by Peter Boyle. Parts of the movie are really good. Other parts, that makes absolutely no sense. But again, he did the same thing. He hung out with Hunter S. Thompson, you know, and he was trying to make a movie that would start his career off or something. It was after Meatballs, but he really wanted to, like, put himself out there as a big movie star or something. But the movie was a complete bomb. It's, um, it's another movie. It's almost unwatchable, again. Because it's really the, the, the thing about Hunter Thompson, and I, I studied him for years, it's really kind of more about how he writes, the very quick wit that he has, the clever thing. And Depp does manage to convey a lot of that. But unfortunately, I think Benicio in the movie is very distracting with all the crazy yeah, shit that goes on. But I but he nailed his character. He's, I can't see anybody else but Benicio playing playing Dr. Gonzo. But I, I just I suppose oh, I just I can't gonna, imagine him being a lawyer, a functioning person. These people well, I mean the okay, both I, I had the, I had this point to make. The reason that Dr. Gonzo exists because he keeps Hunter around because Hunter is his enabler. When he's yeah. not around Hunter, he's a, he's a normal everyday guy. But that's then what it, when he yeah. gets around Hunter, he just turns into a fucking crazy madman. 
I guess that seems, but that seems like kind of like we're intellectualizing this idea. The way I thought of it was that Dr. Gonzo is represents Raul Duke's id, his his lust and his violence and everything. It's very possible this could be a Fight Club scenario where one person exists merely as a psychological extension of another character. How about that? Huh? I never thought of it that way. Come on, he's he's, he's he's Brad Pitt to his Ed Norton. Come on. <laughs> And, and I never thought of it that way. There are a lot of really great like bits in the movie, but sometimes what if you what if you just put the thought in the back of your head that Dr. Gonzo doesn't exist and that all of this is just Raul Duke? <laughs> <laughs> and then what what I'm saying is how the hell did he get out of Vegas and not get arrested? He always seems to disappear. He gets into the car, he drives off, and then he comes back. He keeps coming back, he keeps going. And then you know, I don't know, the whole thing. There was like the really bizarre scene with Ellen Barkin and the pie and everything. It was a very strange scene. And I didn't understand. It was very it. strange. I didn't understand. It made me uncomfortable and I didn't get it. I got it. And I understand what it is. It was the last thing he remembered like after the tape recorder because he was using the tape for the flashbacks. And then he, he the tape broke and then he remembers the knife. And then the knife triggers a flashback while he was on the adrenochrome. And the last thing he remembers before he woke up in the hotel. So, <laughs> me, so I, the, the, I'm saying he found the knife and the knife triggered that backdoor memory of the diner. Okay. The last, the last thing from that night was the diner. All right. All right. So it was a dream within a dream within a flashback. Well, it's not that. Like Basically, that adrenochrome made him lose like X amount of days. Like he, he went on a blackout binge for like three or four days. And so, his subconscious or his regular conscience was gone. So it was like forget me now pills, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, basically, it was he was all on forget me not. So apparently, uh, we we did our show about Ralph Bakshi. We we didn't talk about that. Ralph Bakshi came this close I'm to doing an animated an version of, of it, yeah. an animated version of Fear and Loathing. But I can't imagine Bakshi doing Thompson, dude. That movie would have been okay, dude. That that would have been borderline unwatchable. It would have made no fucking sense whatsoever. Okay, here's what here's as much sense as it would have made. The talking trash, the trash talking to the garbage in the beginning of Hey Good Looking. That's how much Fear and Loathing would have made sense. Oh, okay. If it were done by fucking Ralph Bakshi. It didn't work out because uh, Hunter gave the rights to his girlfriend and his girlfriend liked Johnny Depp in a movie, possibly. And I believe it was because of uh, uh, Depp's influence uh, got Terry Gilliam hired for the role because they were talking about working together for a long time. Well, I don't know if that was, remember, so that was probably Thompson's influence, but I think Depp was already cast, and then Depp, yeah, Depp probably convinced Thompson to hire him. And they had been continuing to work, trying to get a, work on projects for a long time. They did work again on uh, Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassius, uh, and they tried to make the band who killed Don Quixote once, didn't work out, and then he finally got it made with uh, with Adam Driver and Jonathan Price. Very good movie, too, by the way. I got to see that in the theater when it was released. It was released in only one theater. <laughs> and I got. And to it see just it. so happened to be right around you. Yeah, yeah. At, at my um, my Kaufman uh, United Artists Theater over there, and I led the standing ovation and applause, which I was very proud to do, because we had heard about the movie for so long, and he finally got it finished, and it was really good. But again, it's another movie that re depends on the insanity of a character to propel it, story wise. And he really likes this idea, doesn't he? I mean, even Twelve Monkeys is sort of about that too, because we spend. We spend like 90 minutes watching that movie and wondering whether or not Bruce Willis is completely batshit fucking crazy, right? But you see, that's why I say the movie's accessible, because at the end of the day, it was pretty much a deus ex machina. Yeah. You know, it was pretty much a, de a deus ex my, Sorry, my phone went off. It was a deus ex machina, basically, at the end of the movie. You know, and that was that was really the cool thing about it. Then you got most people going like, oh, what's a deus ex machina? It's just like, okay, well, I guess it is a little out of reach. <laughs> But any, any good self-respecting pothead would understand the ending of that movie without a problem. Well, I always understood it. I, the only thing that didn't make sense to me is, is if he dies, how is he looking at the uh, child version of himself? And my wife always tries to explain it to me. I never get uh, time travel looper, loops. Looper, 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 looper. Yes, looper, looper, looper. But uh, I you even can, wrote hey, a time you're, travel you're, script you're myself, and I still don't get it. Dude, your past self can kill your present self, okay? End of story. <laughs> Uh, whatever. Um, <clears throat> I always think of uh, Ron Silver and Time Cop when they accidentally yeah, touch. And I, yeah, <laughs> the same. And you see, I always said that with time travel. That's my favorite way to put it. The same. The same matter cannot occupy the same space. All right. And you see. And you see. Ironically enough, I, I want to get back on it, but I have to say this. 
I just bought it today, Southland Tales. That's another movie that really alienated people, but they borrowed the time cop philosophy. Like that's how they were able to like the world ended was by the same matter occupying the same space, causing the end of the world. Dude, I get really fucking angry when people bring up Southland Tales to me. That's a movie that makes me so fucking angry watching it. Okay, well, for another time, for another time, I'd say. I time. the one I Moving watched on. the version I watched was probably a very early cut. It was it was all chopped to ribbons. Maybe there's a director's cut out there that makes sense of it. I don't know, but it makes um, me fucking angry. <laughs> when this is over, we'll talk. Uh, but anyway, back to Mr. Gilliam and some parallels here between Richard Kelly, apparently. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically what we were saying about twelve monkeys, time travel, yada yada yada. Let's go to the arcade. Moving on. <sighs> the the crazy fucking circus and all that. Um. Well, I don't want to get into too much. We're <laughs> we're going on it, but basically, it's like a it's basic. It does a road movie, and it's just basically yeah. the exploits of uh, Raul Duke and Doctor Gonzo, and then I guess the two or three days that they spend together before Doctor Gonzo takes off for the first time. For the first time. <laughs> now you see, like the whole thing is number one, you're gonna love or hate the story. Okay, it's like. The story itself is literally just a two hour and 10 minute drug trip. Mm -hmm. That's all this movie is. Nothing more, nothing less. Followed by some very great visuals if you want to know what it's like to be fucked up on acid. People have a problem with that, uh, such as you. Well, I'll tell you this. When I first saw it, I had the misfortune of renting a pan and scan videotape of it. So it made very little sense to me watching it. And I got a contact high off of it. The last time I had a contact high like that was when I saw Natural Born Killers. Uh, because I felt like Gilliam's visuals were trying to make me high. And then I watched it again in uh, widescreen and letterbox on IFC, I think it was on. And it made a lot more sense to me that time. Then I watched it again. So it just makes more sense to me as I continue to watch the movie. I thought the movie made perfect sense. Maybe on the second try. The first try, like you said, I got a big contact eye from watching it. It was just so much to take in, I had to stop it. And then I picked it up the next day, and then I watched it again. My whole fault I have is it slows down just a little bit, damn near screeching to a halt when Christina Ricci Christina gets Ricci, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, when her character gets introduced, it's... The With her flow, weird cardboard paintings all yeah, over the, the room. the flow and the pacing just dies. Like, there's your Terry Gilliam problem. Like... That's where his screenwriting problem Yeah, it's, it's really yeah, unusual it's... because this was around the time that I really enjoyed watching Christina Ricci. I always thought she was a wonderful actress around that time. We're talking like, you know, the late 90s, that kind of thing. The minute she's on the screen, the whole thing comes to a screeching halt. But then it kicks back into gear once she's off the screen. Right. And basically, basically, I say it kicks into gear again once he takes the adrenaline home. Yeah, I guess. And um, that's, well, no, that's goes... really when it kicks into gear because then he goes on that massive fucking trip where he hallucinates Benicio del Toro as a freaking uh as a freaking monster with seven tits on its back. I was I was thinking the point of the movie comes when he's at that uh conference for uh lawmakers for for cops rather law enforcement. Yeah, for the DAs and shit. He's there and they're talking about the dangers of drugs. Meanwhile, Vietnam is going on and there's this enormous amount of hypocrisy between government, law enforcement, all that stuff. Some of that stuff hits very close to home today in 2020. And that maybe a little bit more of that, maybe a little bit more of that kind of that kind of storytelling would have been better. for. The so movie. what years of what you and I are both agreeing on is they should have dropped the Christina Ricci subplot. Yeah, I, d I don't understand what the point of that was. I really don't. That, that, I, I, I don't think it goes anywhere. It's a subplot. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't take the us anywhere. Thing, it, 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 you know what it exists? That, okay, that subplot exists as a reason for Hunter to do the adrenochrome. So, again, it's, it's just bad plotting. Like, you literally, you want your high point to come off of this tangent, and then, but it, the tangent itself is weak. Right. It, it, like, it exists for no reason at all. Because what happens? Like, you see her, Gonzo or fucking Raul convinces him that, oh, it's underage. He gets her out of there. She calls the hotel. He freaks out. And then he takes the adrenochrome. Right. And then we, next time we see her is when they're trying to leave Vegas. And then she's getting kicked out of the hotel they put and her she's, in. And, and she walks into the middle of the street. And they're, yeah. They're, like, scared like, to death. Yeah. Again, it, 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 her being in that movie has no forbearance on the plot. That's my weakness with this movie. Other than that, I still love the movie. 
It my just fa- sucks well, when you get to it just sucks when you get to that point. My favorite bit is when he talks when he when he takes Gonzo to the airport, drives off right before he drives off, he says, There he goes, one of God's own prototypes. <laughs> too weird to live, too rare to die. That yeah. that again, the brilliance of the writing is just it's wonderful and everything. But uh I'm frankly I'm glad that Gilliam directed it. But I have a feeling that I have a feeling that Alex Cox would have just gone absolutely psycho with his cameras. He probably wouldn't have done as much of the visual stuff that Gilliam does, but he would try to do weird in camera kind of stuff. Cause that's how he works. Yeah. The only other, uh, some of the CGI is a little dated now, a, a little, you know, some of it, but, but, but some of it, still, still very striking. Like when he, like a lot of it was done in camera, but then like <clears throat> when, uh, when Catherine Hellman's face turns into a Mori eel, <laughs> that's when it's kind of, that's when your CGI starts getting a little bad. That was when I was thinking of Brazil. Because she kind of reminds me of her character in Brazil with her weird pulled back cheeks and everything. Uh, that movie. <laughs> that fucking movie. But I love that movie, man. Brazil is fantastic. It absolutely is. I love is. that movie. Dude. That's All such right. a great movie. So it's time to move on to a movie you absolutely adored. Yeah, oh, apparently. God, yes. <laughs> Yes. Oh, God, yes. Now, this, I'm going to sp- speak in all seriousness. This is my favorite Terry Gilliam movie. I think this is the one where all of his crazy ideas sort of congeal. It's a movie where he has absolutely no money, sort of goes out and just shoots on location, shoots at a within this this real weird and natural organic production design that he manages to create around this little girl played by this incredible actress, Jodel Furland, who is just absolutely wonderful in this movie. And it's called Tideland, and uh, it came out to, uh, geez. 2005. came out 2005. It was absolutely torn apart and hated by critics all over the world, even though it did have a premiere, I believe, at Cannes. I'm not sure. It was, I forgot. It was like the, the, somebody called it the most disgusting, repulsive movie they'd ever seen. I really don't see that, frankly. <laughs> I can see why they said it. I don't know where they get come off saying oh, shit like I that. Do, I do. I do. Gruesomely awful, I think. Entertainment Weekly called it gruesomely awful, gave it an F. It's crazy, dangerous, and sometimes gorgeous. Gorgeous, yes. I, I thought about one of my favorite ways to say to start this off, and I'm just going to lead out and say this much. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth did it better. John, you okay. ignorant slut. I said, Pan's Labyrinth did it better. <laughs> Pan's Labyrinth, <laughs> didn't that come out be- after this movie? Oh, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a Guillermo who's a better visionary. How and dare who's a, he? No, who's a great visionary and a far better fucking storyteller. Oh, come on. Okay. You and I just agreed that Terry Gilliam's storytelling is his weakness. Guillermo is a phenomenal storyteller. Uh, it might be opinion, his weakness, but I think of, he does a fine job here. I'm sorry, but that being said, Tideland, while it was a beautiful, well-acted film, I'm sorry, it made me too uncomfortable, and it dropped me out of my comfort zone. What what, what was it about it specifically that uh, uh, made you uncomfortable? Let's see, two cousins trying to neck each other. One of them being 11, the other one being mentally disabled and obviously over the age of 18. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's a little bit much for me. I'm sorry. I don't like that shit. <laughs> okay. Okay. That Like that, that's, and dude, I'm sorry that, that watching the kissing was so fucking uncomfortable. Okay. I'm sorry. It was too uncomfortable. I'm a father of two little girls. Well, that, we that, watched that. it. We watched it with Regan. Regan, um, I don't know what Regan thought of it. Regan never tells me anything ever. But it didn't really, it didn't really bug me. I've seen, bo- I've seen worse. Bother, dude, the whole, dude, the Jeff Bridges thing. I'm okay, dude. The whole, I get where Gilliam wanted to go with this. You've got this girl with obvious disassociative identity disorder. You've got this mentally challenged cousin of hers that you don't even know what's wrong with him. You just know he had brain surgery. And it's just well, like, we don't even realize that he that he he's her cousin. Oh no! Well, well, until much but, later in the movie. But then when you find it out, it's just like ew! It's like the, it was already ew before, <laughs> but then it's like double ew! It's like no, why? Uh, oh, just when I think about it, it's so disgusting. But it's just so sad about this 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 poor kid that's got 
just literally straight up 100 percent disassociative identity disorder i don't know she, if I, I i don't know if i can go so far as to say that she has that kind of a mental problem what i think actually yeah, no she does because then okay here's the thing you first see her in the movie mouthing with her finger dolls yeah and then later on she's no longer mouthing she's hearing the voices in her head she's here again did but that could be just her that. way that could be just her way of escaping from the problem of her dead father and she knows somewhere but in she, her brain she, that her but father's dead. She doesn't dead. know. She doesn't even, that's that's how disassociative she is. She doesn't even know he's dead. She thinks he's faking because he's owed he's like gone for like two th maybe I think I said two days at most. He's been under while he's been high and she just thinks, "Oh, he's still on vacation." Yeah. I mean, her parents fucked her in the head so much to where she doesn't even know what's real and what's fucking fantasy. You know, mm. at least in Pan's Labyrinth in her case, you you yeah, it was harder to to, to associate. It could have been real. It couldn't have I been can, real. But you I, know, I, I, it's, I like it's funny how you it. it was it was traumatic for. Well, you keep bringing up movie. Pan's Labyrinth, and Pan's Labyrinth, I felt had a disconnect for me. I I was I was too much. There was there were obvious uh, evil forces at work against this girl in Pan's Labyrinth. Whereas I feel like this girl is just sort of a victim of a bunch of crazy people. She's just surrounded by a bunch of crazy people. Yeah, she is a victim, and it's just so sad that she. I mean, I guess at the end of the end of the day, it's a good happy ending for her. And, at and the also, end of as the I day. said, I think Jodell Furland is a much better actress than the little girl from Pan's Labyrinth. I don't <laughs> know about that. I think she I, is. But I'm not. I'm not going to sell her short. I'm not going to sell her short. <laughs> I mean, but then, but then I was wondering. I'm just like when I saw him put the shotgun shells down on the train track, saying it was for the the monster shark. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my god. This motherfucker is going to derail a goddamn train. Yeah. Huh. And I'm just like, and when it happens, you're just like, I fucking knew it, but why did he go there? Um, again, he, he was probably one of the more disturbed. And you notice how he speaks the same language as the girl. I mean, they both, they both talk in the same kind of vague understanding of reality in combination with fantasy. But he's older because he's retarded. She's just a child whatever he does, it's going to somehow result in this girl getting away from this situation. So in a way, he's kind of her hero. You see, me and you were looking at it from two <laughs> ends of a different spectrum. You see, I mean, I mean, I mean again, and you're fine with that. I, I'm hoping you respect my opinion as much as I respect yours. I'm not sure. going to fight you on it. I'm not going to fight you on it because... I, I just saw. I just saw more. I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. I just you're saw more from... visual poetry. I think than than you were you were hoping to find. I, I know that you're looking at it as this is her. Basically, the whole point of this movie is for her to regain a sense of normalcy by the end of it. This is what and I'm hoping, the, and, and this is what does happen, right? And at, at the end of happens. the movie. And you want to know what? That's what you went into it with. Like you went into it with that mindset, and when you got that result, that's why you were happy when you saw it. You see, I didn't go into it with that mindset. I was just, I was so feeling bad for this kid, but I didn't, and I honestly didn't think the train wreck was going to be the well, whole where do thing. You put that, it, what, what spectrum of feeling bad for her would you put her on as far as Gilliam characters? Because in every one of his movies, there's always a character that you feel really bad for. You feel bad for Perry in Fisher King. You feel bad for for Cole in 12 Monkeys. You kind of feel bad for Hunter and Fear and Loathing. Yeah, you, <laughs> you feel a little bad for him. You know, you feel you feel bad for a lot of these characters as they show up, like Jonathan Price's character in Brazil. You feel bad for Michael Palin's character in Jabberwocky. They are victims to an extent, and they, and they, they learn how to negotiate the craziness so that they can have their own crazy logic in their heads that helps them deal with these props. I mean, it's, it's just really sad when you see a character like her, that her, her mind is so warped that she's off in this dream world because of her drug addicted parents. And it was just really hard watching Jeff Bridges play a heroin addict. Yeah, it was. Man, man, you know. <laughs> but he was, but, uh, he was, again, he was really good in it. And for a oh, long the acting, time. The, I will say this, the acting in this movie is 100% on point. Yeah, even Jennifer not, Tilly I, was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, she was she was amazing. Like, dude, I, I, it's like this. It's like I want to look at it from an objective critic's point of view. My objectivities are: while I think it's a well shot, beautiful looking, well acted film, I can't recommend it just because it made me feel way too uncomfortable, and it's not something I'm going to revisit anytime soon. Hmm. But at the, as as the dude would say, that's just like your opinion. Man. It's just like your opinion, man. I hate the fucking Eagles, man. <laughs> um, I well. I couldn't disagree more. It's one of my favorite movies. It's a 
I felt like it was the culmination of everything Terry Gilliam was trying to do at that time. And this is, I think, the kind of story he likes to tell. He loves this this kind of... It, 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 that's what I said before when I was I was trying to prep you for it. I said that it was basically Psycho meets Alice in Wonderland. And that is that is what it is when you think about it. Mm -hmm. And the book is very much the same way. It was written by a book by... Uh, um, Oh, Mitch Cullen, I think, is the guy who wrote the book, and it's 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 told in the same first person that uh, story in the way that Jeliza Rose tells the story in in the movie. My only problem with it, if I were to have a problem with it, is that the visuals get a little bit repetitive because we're all we're stuck in one location, yeah. and it's more than obvious. It's kind of a low budget film in that regard, but otherwise, just beautifully shot, beautifully shot, uh, beautifully written, and it has a nightmare, fantasy, chaotic feeling to it. That that's um, it's 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 you know he has to make a movie his way. If anyone else tried to make this movie another way, it would wouldn't turn out as well. I don't think. I don't think it would have either. But I mean, again, I I, I just can't recommend it. it. Made me too uncomfortable. And I mean, again, there are some positives there, but it's still just an uncomfortable experience for me. One that I don't want to revisit again anytime soon. I never thought a movie could make me that uncomfortable, man. I really didn't. Really? Not I even actually, not even yeah, possession. Actually found, you found it. You you recommended me a movie that fucking broke me. You, I pre <laughs> hope you appreciate it. Wait, you what about me. what about Possession? <laughs> you didn't really break me on Possession, but that made you, you feel see, uncomfortable was, too. Yeah, but at the end of the day, it was monsters. You know, the worst monster is a human. Yeah. You know, you know, at the end, of, so that's why it's a little more uncomfortable. So, like I said, dude, you you broke me with this movie. Confuculations. <laughs> Confuculations. <laughs> that's a good one. Confuculations, everybody. I'm gonna put up a graphic. <laughs> Maybe I'll put some fireworks up there, and it'll say "confuculations." Yeah, uh, I'm glad. I, I'm glad you and I didn't go ad infinitum last night. Me and you would have been up till like four in the morning having discussions about this movie. I'm glad we could air it out here. Uh, I do. Okay, I did have one more thing to say. I have another movie that Terry Gilliam made that got very little press, very little advertisement, promotion, or anything. I have it on Blu-ray. I bought it from Amazon because there was only one copy left, and I got a good deal on it. And it's been sitting in my uh, media center for a while. I might pop it open next Sunday. It's called The Zero Theorem. I hear that is a really good movie. And it stars Christoph Waltz, David Thewlis, Tilda Swinton. Matt Damon, I think, is in it for five seconds. And I'm looking forward to seeing it. I had no idea that he directed this. And then I found it. So there it was. Maybe I'll take a look at it. But it was a movie that he made in 2013. And it made no money. <laughs> it made I actually, absolutely uh, I, no money. I have a digital copy of it on my computer. And I've been saving it to watch. And I've never watched it. Well, maybe, you know what? We'll, uh, we'll plan something. We'll do it later on. And we'll talk about it. How about that? Yeah, we can do that. Well, a movie, that, a Terry Gilliam flick that neither you or I have ever seen. So that that could be interesting. It could be very interesting. And I enjoy Christoph Waltz. Oh, so do I. Come on, man. Incidentally, Bat have you have you have you seen ba uh, Alita: Battle Angel yet? Uh, I own it. Need to watch it. I know he's great in it, from what I heard. Maybe we should do that in, in, as a companion to this, because it's that's another movie I really did enjoy quite a bit. We'll work something out. All right, but until then, I think next time we're going to be talking about Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. Until then, uh, talk to you later. And, and like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. God damn it, I forgot. <laughs> and remember, this is all a form of media-induced psychological extortion. As Terry Gilliam would say. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night.